style. For March, we'll be considering five competitions of historic proportions. Each week, we'll look at a couple or more of our favorite monarchs, and you will vote on the winner. You can vote anytime during the month. Please, please follow me on social media so you can participate and vote. I'm at at Shake Up History on Instagram and Twitter and Carol Ann Lloyd Shake Up History on Facebook. Our first competition is about the very foundation of the monarchy. Which monarch do you think contributed more to the essence of kingship in early Britain, King Arthur or Richard the Lionheart? Those monarchs take the field on Wednesday, March 3rd, and you choose the winner. Next, a rosy battle, or should I say, a rosy war. We've looked at the Wars of the Roses before, but this time we're pitting king against king. You make the choice. Who deserved to win the Wars of the Roses? Henry the Sixth or Edward the Fourth? They both had at least one victory over the other, but now it's time for a final round. Your vote chooses the big rosy winner. Then it's on to the Tudors. The big guy himself asked this question in 1537 in the Whitehall mural. Did Henry the Seventh or Henry the Eighth contribute more to the Tudor dynasty and to England? Henry the Eighth answered that question, choosing himself, but I'm not willing to take his word for it. So what do you think? Which of the first two tutors made the most difference? Then, as it's Women's History Month, as well as March Madness Month and Monarch Madness Month, our final two contests will be between the queens. First off, a classic battle between cousins. Who was the more successful queen, Elizabeth I of England or Mary, Queen of Scots? Use whatever criteria you like and choose your winner. And finally, we can't end a royal rumble without a nod to the women whose lives redefined Henry VIII over and over and over and three more times. The six wives of Henry VIII changed England, changed Henry, and changed history. So, now you decide which wife had the most impact. Who changed Henry or England or history the most significantly? So, are you ready to rumble? Round one of Monarch Madness cuts right to the heart of the English monarchy. What is it? And who contributed most to the early notion of English or British kingship? Two kings stand out, both of whom developed larger-than-life legends that carried centuries into the future. Both can be said to epitomize the notion of what it means to be a British monarch. But only one can win round one of Monarch Madness. So who will it be? King Arthur or Richard the Lionheart? King Arthur. Was there a real King Arthur? We actually don't know. But his legend has affected British and world history and literature for centuries. So whether there was a real person or not, there is no doubt that King Arthur is a contender for the crown here. There are several touchstones in Arthur's story that make him the stuff of legend. Arthur comes into view for the first time in descriptions of the Battle of Baden Hill. The Britons, having been abandoned by the Romans, were fighting off Germanic invaders, in other words, the Angles and the Saxons, in the 5th to the 6th century. There are tales of a great warrior fighting on behalf of the Britons. This is when we first hear about a warrior named Arthur, or Arturius, or Ambrosius Oriolanus by Gildas and Bede, associated with this battle. The name Arturus is sometimes used, but that could be a title. Celtic people remained strong in Cornwall, Cumberland, and Wales, even after the rest of the country fell to the Saxons. Celtic bards kept the story of this military leader alive. As very few people wrote or read during this time, the stories were primarily oral legends passed down from one generation to the next. We have a scrap here or there on a manuscript, but it is an incomplete record. So was this Arthur, the famous warrior who led people in battle? The next source we find is Nennius, the ninth century monk who wrote Historia Britonum, the history of the Britons. 
and identified Arthur as fighting against the Germanic invaders. It includes several battles featuring Arthur as a commanding warrior as well as a valiant and praiseworthy man. Around this time, there's also a Welsh poem, I Gadoan, that doesn't talk directly about Arthur, but in describing a different warrior says he is brave, but quote, no Arthur. So by this time, the legend of Arthur, the brave warrior and leader, was becoming well-known and a touchstone for courage and valor. Later, Welsh writers drew on Nennius's work, and Arthur's fame spread beyond Wales and the Celtic world. This is especially true in the 11th century, after William the Conqueror connected England and northern France with his invasion of England in 1066. Geoffrey of Monmouth solidified and expanded the legend of King Arthur in the 12th century with his Historia Regnum Britannia, History of the Kings of Britain. He included the story of Arthur, his manuscript, a copy of which resides in the British Library, even includes a portrait of the legendary king. Monmouth included Arthur's powerful sword, powerful sword Caliburn, later Excalibur, his trusted knight and friend Lancelot, Queen Guinevere, and Merlin, the wizard who teaches and helps him. Monmouth and others claimed this account was based on a now-lost Celt manuscript. A few years after Monmouth, in 1160, French poet Chrétien de Troyes gave Arthur a spiritual quest by having him search for the Holy Grail. He also invented Camelot, the castle and city where the court of Arthur resides. From that time, legends of the adventure of King Arthur and his knights were told in hundreds of manuscripts written in many languages. Alas de Abelas, also Alain de Lille, asked, quote, what place is there within the bounds of the Empire of Christendom to which the winged praise of Arthur of Britain has not extended? The idea of a brotherhood of knights, symbolized by that large round table, enters the myth around the 12th or 13th century. This appeal to the concept of chivalry that was taking hold at the time. There is a story that in the 13th century, an abbot speaking to his monks noticed that a few of them have fallen asleep. To get their attention, he said, There once was a mighty king whose name was Arthur, and all the monks woke up and started listening. This is almost certainly an invented story, but it does remind us of the power of the legendary author to capture attention. The myth clearly merges with the real world in the reigns of Edward I and Edward III. Edward I was a fan of the Arthurian legend and sought to emulate the famous king. It's believed that he had a great round table built in 1290 for a festival held to celebrate the marriage of his daughter. That table now hangs in Winchester Cathedral. It measures five and a half meters in diameter and weighs more than 2,500 pounds. Edward III picked up on his grandfather's interest in King Arthur. He was a great warrior, known for restoring royal authority after the mostly disastrous reign of his father. And he wanted to solidify this order through a chivalric code. He wanted to establish an order of chivalry based on the Knights of the Round Table. Edward III established the Order of the Garter in 1348. It is still the most senior knighthood in the British honor system, continuing the legend of Arthur. That legend of Arthur was considerably advanced in the late 15th century when Thomas Mallory published Le Mort d'Arthur in 1485. Mallory retold stories that had been passed down orally and in writing for hundreds of years. He also extended the story. We see Arthur is the son of Uther Pendragon, who was raised in secret, and that his sword is a powerful one. Arthur marries Guinevere, founds a group of knights, at a round table at Camelot. Arthur then goes on a quest for the Holy Grail. It's a tale of idealized knighthood, tournaments, and grand castles. The ultimate downfall of Arthur comes from failure in the three themes in Mallory's telling, love, loyalty, and religion. Marth Mallory also associated Camelot with Winchester, which leads us to the next time the legend touches history, the Tudors. Henry VII took the throne the same year Mallory published Le Mort d'Arthur. Henry VII was drawn to Arthur through, the, through their shared Welsh background and the idea of a great destiny of a monarch coming forth. To reinforce this, he arranged for his first child to be born at Winchester, 
the place associated with King Arthur. Henry was able to accomplish his goal. That child was a healthy son, and he named him Arthur. Ultimately, Henry VII's plan to connect his dynasty with King Arthur through his son Arthur fell through when Arthur died in 1502. But Henry VIII continued the connection and ordered the round table painted Tudor green and white in honor of a visit for the whole, from the Holy Roman Emperor. At that time, the image of King Arthur painted on the table was said to resemble Henry himself. That portrait of Arthur has been repainted, but the table kept the rest of its Tudor elements, the green and white theme, and the Tudor rose at the center. The legend of King Arthur continues in the 18th century, when antiquarians like William Stukeley emphasized Arthur's association with Cornwall and parts of Wales. Stukeley carried out one of the first archaeological investigations at Cadbury Castle in Somerset, believed by many to be the original site of Camelot. Then in the 19th century, Alfred Lord Tennyson told the story of Arthur and Camelot as an epic poem entitled Idols of the King. And in the 20th century, Arthur found his way to stage and screen. In a more recent adoption of the legend, in 1963, after the death of President John F. Kennedy, his widow Jackie enshrined her husband's presidency in the story and language of Camelot. So for some 1,500 years, King Arthur represented a valiant warrior who inspired several dynasties of the British monarchy and eventually also perhaps conquered the U.S. presidency, a likely candidate for the round one winner. Richard the Lionheart. Legenders, legends are not limited to King Arthur. Here's a legend about the military prowess of Richard I. Mid-13th century text, Romance of Richard Creux de Lyon, describes the incident where Richard charged against Saladin so forcefully he knocked him to the ground. Then Richard pushed forward to slay several Muslims, inspiring his knights to join in and kill 60,000 members of the enemy's guard. Historians agree there isn't any truth to this story, but it does demonstrate Richard's reputation as a great and inspiring warrior. However, since we do know many things about Richard's historic life and impact, we are able to attach the legend with information about the life and reign of this king. Richard's mother, Eleanor of Aquitaine, involved Richard in leadership of her territorial holdings. In 1171, at age 15, Richard joined Eleanor to visit the Aquitaine to put down a rebellion. They also laid the foundation stone of St. Augustine's Monastery. Richard was recognized as Duke of Aquitaine and Count of Poitou in 1172. Richard then joined his brothers in their quest to topple father, King Henry II, from the English throne the next year. King Louis VII of France was supporting the rebellion against the English king, perhaps because his first wife, Eleanor of Aquitaine, had left him and then married Henry II. Although Eleanor hadn't given Louis any sons, she gave Henry II several And then she backed her son's rebellion against their father. So the king's sons, his wife, and the French king all collaborated to tip Henry II off the throne. Louis VII even knighted Richard as part of the effort to defeat his father. And Richard was involved in leading the campaign to invade eastern Normandy, then held by Henry. Despite the efforts of his family and enemies, Henry II prevailed. He forgave his sons and imprisoned his wife. As Duke of Aquitaine and Count of Poitou, Richard had the opportunity to prove himself again when the Aquitaine barons rebelled against the English crown. He made a name for himself as a great field commander and was able to overcome the resistance of the heavily fortified Telburg Castle in 1179. But alongside the reputation he was gaining as a warrior was the less savory reputation he gained from ruthless treatment of prisoners. Richard's brother Henry heir to the throne, died in June 1183. Henry II had crowned his eldest son, King Designate, back in 1170 to ensure the succession. But the young king, as he was known, died before his father and derailed Henry II's succession plans. Son Geoffrey also died in a tournament in 1186. That left Richard as the obvious heir to the throne. But Henry II wouldn't officially name him as such. So, in 1189, 
Richard and their and his younger brother John reached out to the new king of France, Philip, to rebel against their father again. They were supported by their mother once more. Henry's great knight, Sir William Marshall, squared off against Richard and managed to knock him off his horse, reportedly the only man to ever accomplish this. Two things come to mind. First, this is reminiscent of the legend that Lancelot was the only knight able to unhorse the legendary King Arthur. Also, considering how Richard III later suffers when he loses his horse, it turns out if you're a king named Richard, it's best to keep a spare horse or two nearby. But back to the story. Marshall decided not to kill Richard, which earned him Richard's gratitude. Eventually, Henry II agreed to name Richard as his heir. He died shortly thereafter, on the 6th of July, 1189, and Richard became King of England. One of his first acts as king was to officially release his mother from prison and enlist her help in establishing his reign. He could not have asked for a better partner. Richard's coronation was held the 3rd of September, 1189. In those days, the coronation was considered to officially begin the king's reign. A copy of the description of Richard's coronation still exists in the Bodleian Library. Richard was greeted by a chanting crowd of nobles, clergy, and the public. Richard himself took the crown from the altar and handed it to the Archbishop of Canterbury, who then crowned the king. As he had no wife, Richard's mother, Eleanor, was the highest-ranking woman and took the position of honor at his coronation. After the ceremony, a banquet was held in Westminster Hall, setting a tradition that would last for centuries. Richard was now king of England and the land, and also king of the lands in France that belonged to his family, Normandy, Maine, and Aquitaine. The new king had promised to give Aquitaine to John, but he decided not to do that. In 1187, Richard had pledged to take up the cross and join the crusade to free Jerusalem from the Muslims. This was his main priority as king, and he was willing to sacrifice pretty much anything to make it happen. He spent everything in the royal treasury, asked for new taxes, and agreed that William of Scotland could rule with autonomy in exchange for cash. These decisions appeal foolhardly and reckless to us now. In fact, Richard's commitment to the Third Crusade might be seen as a sign he was not that interested in his own kingdom. But in Richard's day, these were seen as signs of his great devotion to God. So it was off to the Crusades. This crusade represented an attempt by three of the most powerful states of Western Europe to reconquer the Holy Land and free Jerusalem from Saladin. Richard joined King Philip of France and German Emperor Frederick Barbarossa. Richard's fleet sailed from Dartmouth in 1190, while he set out to meet Philip with about 800 men in Marseille. After waiting in vain for his fleet, he hired ships and left for Sicily. He met his troops in Messina, which he captured and was able to release his sister, Joan, from imprisonment there. He and Philip had a falling out because Richard decided that, despite a long-standing agreement, he would not marry Philip's sister after all. Shortly after setting sail from Sicily, Richard's fleet was hit by a storm and several ships ran aground. Duke Isaac seized Richard's ships and their treasure. In addition, Isaac captured Richard's sister, Joan, and the woman he was to marry, Berengaria of Navarre. After attempting a diplomatic solution, Richard conquered Cyprus and forced Isaac to flee. Richard then married Berengaria in Cyprus, where she was crowned Queen of England and Queen of Cyprus in Cyprus. Now Richard has postponed his journey to Jerusalem with two unplanned battles. He had prevailed in Sicily and in Cyprus, but he was impatient to get going. He landed at Acre, a city on the coast of the Kingdom of Jerusalem, in June 1191. He immediately began building weapons to assault the city and undermine the fortification walls. While Guy of Lusignan had been unsuccessfully trying to defeat the city for 20 weeks, Richard was successful in just over a month. Frustrated with Richard over the fallout with his sister and Richard's assistance that everything be done his way, as well as being in poor health, Philip left the Holy Land. He left 7,000 trips behind to help Richard capture Jerusalem. Richard's continued success in battle was especially seen in comparison to the failure of others, and this earned him the nickname, the Lionheart. It was a recognition of his military prowess and his fearlessness, but he was also earning a reputation for ruthlessness for his treatment and execution of prisoners. 
Still, Richard's reputation was a cause for celebration back in England, even though he had been away from the nation since shortly after his coronation. Richard had one more significant victory in the crusade experience. In 1191, he defeated Saladin's army at Arsuf. But although he was in view of Jerusalem, he could proceed no further. He realized his army might be able to storm and conquer the city, but Richard knew he did not have the ability to defend it against future attacks. And it was probably time to get back to England. So Richard negotiated a deal with Saladin. He did achieve some benefits, including a guarantee of safe treatment for Christian pilgrims to the Holy Land and a strip of land around Acre. It was not the total victory that had been the goal, but Richard could say that his efforts had made things better for his cause. And there was always the Fourth Crusade, which would surely come soon. It's likely on the crusade that Richard discovered a weapon known as Greek fire. Long used by the Byzantines, this was a flammable liquid that could be fired at an enemy. Richard probably acquired the formula from Arab alchemists who had stolen the secret recipe. Richard put this high-tech weapon to use later, to use against the French. After his experiences getting to the Holy Land, Richard probably should have expected troubles returning to England. This became one of the worst of his mishaps. He was shipwrecked and captured by Leopold of Austria. Richard had offended Leopold during their time together in the Crusades, and Leopold took his revenge by passing Richard to the new Holy Roman Emperor. He held Richard captive for ransom. Eleanor of Aquitaine went to work to raise the ransom money and was a key figure in the negotiations to secure his release. Their ransom was a staggering sum, uh, sum, 150,000 marks. When Richard finally returned to England, he soon left again in 1194 to defend his holdings in France. Richard's former ally, Philip II, had turned against him. Richard's brother, John, had revolted while Richard was away at the Crusades, and Philip helped him, which allowed Philip to seize Normandy. In need of funds and troops, Richard struck a new deal with his barons that allowed him to raise men and money. The barons were willing to supply money instead of additional troops, and Richard was willing to pay mercenaries. During his effort to defend his land in France, Richard was accidentally struck by a stray arrow. The great warrior king died when his wound became infected. Richard's death did not put an end to his legend or impact on the English monarchy. One of the greatest examples is the folktale Robin Hood. The earliest evidence of this story dates back to the 13th or 14th century, although its placement in the reign of Richard I comes a century or so later. Ultimately, the story focuses on the brave and good adventurer Robin Hood who goes about helping ordinary people. Robin Hood's chief opponent is the Sheriff of Nottingham, who is often assisted and supported by bad King John. Good King Richard, as he is often called, is off fighting for God and freedom, while the wicked King John makes things difficult in England. Richard is occasionally portrayed as returning to grand fanfare in England, a symbol of things becoming right again with the world. And even more recently, Richard Coeur de Lyon was emblazoned on the collective English consciousness when a statue depicting the king on his horse, sword raised high in triumph, was placed on a pedestal in Old Palace Yard outside the Palace of Westminster in London. Originally created for the Great Exhibition of 1851, it now faces the House of Lords. Just like its subject, the statue and its placement was a subject of some controversy, with a dispute about it going inside the Great Hall or possibly to another location altogether. But it now stands proudly outside the building that symbolizes the British government, the location where Parliament meets, and where the monarch attends the state opening of Parliament. The statue was damaged during World War II, but remains standing and has now been restored. It has become a true symbol of the monarchy. Now it's your turn. So there you have it. Two men, one possibly not real and one very much real, both the stuff of myth and legend. King Arthur and Richard the Lionheart contributed to the legends and reality of the monarchy four years. What is your vote? I'll be checking Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter, or you can certainly reach out to me, Carol Ann at carolannloyd.com, or leave a comment on the podcast. And for our next round next week, who deserved to win the Wars of the Roses? 
Thank you for playing Monarch Madness. Now, before you go, please take a moment to subscribe, leave a rating, and share with a friend. And I always love hearing what you think. Thank you so much. Be sure to make your voice heard. Vote for your favorite monarch at at Shake Up History on Instagram and Twitter and Carol Ann Lloyd Shake Up History on Facebook. And let's keep shaking up history together. Thank you.